Uncanny Valley, and we'll we'll come on to that. Um, I, uh, uh, I I I like the um, uh, new vocabulary that's developing in this area. I particularly like uh, Mark's um, uh, term of subprime data earlier on. So we're we're definitely getting a new sort of set of uh, terms for the dictionary. Um, I want to really talk about the way in which personal data is being used by brands. Um, I'm using the term personal data and big data somewhat interchangeably um, because it does depend somewhat a little bit upon your focus but from a marketing perspective big data is uh, comprised of what is ultimately personal data. Um, now I think it's clear that um, the, the way in which um, uh, personal data is currently being used um, it represents a huge challenge for the market research industry um, because uh, database marketing companies have effectively taken ownership of this um, very rapidly uh, and you're using it to drive predictive analytics um, personalized in terms of personalized advertising marketing promotion personalized customer experiences and so on um, and we can see that uh, the influence and the, the way in which that's shaping um, the priorities of business um, not least in the way in which um, uh, funds are increasingly being diverted from uh, uh, market research uh, budgets through to big data analytics budgets. Um, now, market research has traditionally been the custodian of consumer understanding and I think it's our job to start exploring, as Mark was earlier, some of the limitations um, of, of this um, because I think actually not a huge amount of work has been done to define what the boundaries of this are, um, despite the threats, as I see it, to our industry. But also, we need to think about, well, what are the implications of personal data for our business model, um, and how, how, what are the different ways in which we can be using it uh, to make it not just a threat, but also an opportunity. Now, I think there are a number of different ways in which we can sort of explore that, and I want to take a particular path through it today. Um, but first of all, let's just um, look at the way in which uh, marketers uh, currently think about um, big data. Uh, we did a, a survey earlier on in the year with The Guardian um, on attitudes um, amongst marketers in, uh, around personal data, big data, uh, speaking to both marketers and consumers. Now, marketers considered big data um, it's completely changing their industry. And I think we knew that, but just the scale of it is, is pretty impressive. Um, you know, over half of them are saying it is very, very important to what I do. Um, lots of discussion about the way in which it's um, fundamentally changing the marketing um, paradigm um, and the skill sets which are needed um, are certainly um, effectively in, in catch up mode. Um, and you know why the why the focus? What's the you know what, what's the sort of driver for this? Well, a number of um, reasons really, but um, uh, uh, it's typically driven by the opportunities for targeted marketing. So cutting through in a very sort of crowded, multi-channel environment. Um, opportunities for personalization, um, uh, making um, uh, it, it possible to stand out more in an increasingly commoditized offerings. Uh, it's easier to justify than sort of large scale expenditure on um, brand based TV advertising, but also everybody is doing it and there's effectively something of an arms race um, uh, between brands as to how much people are able to uh, leverage the value um, from, the, uh, uh, from the data which they hold on consumers. So where are consumers in themselves in all of this? Um, uh, pretty perplexed, frankly. Um, I think that from our, from our survey work in this area, there is a general awareness that much of their online and shopping activity is tracked, um, that uh, most companies do it, and, uh, and there's an awareness that their data is then traded. Um, so there's a sort of general understanding um, that this is going on, but there's a lack of clarity about what is being collected, why it's being collected, how it's being used. Now, there is also, perhaps more importantly, um, a lack of real evidence that it works for many people. Um, now, 27% when we, we, we questioned considered that uh, in general, 
and this is a you know we are taking this at a at a, at a general average level that um, products and services are being tailored to meet their particular needs um, and of course I think many of us are familiar with these uh, strange Amazon recommendations that um, uh, that that you can uh, get uh, if you order if you order one thing then there's a somewhat quirky recommendation made to you which um, appears to be completely unrelated um, and I think there is there seems to be from my perception a lack of willingness by brands to engage in an open transparent debate about the way in which their data is being used about the degree to which um, uh, it is it is effective um, because it, clearly there's, there's an awful lot invested in this area now that lack of engagement I think leaves um, brands very vulnerable to uh, customer backlash um, a good example of that were the litter bins in the city of London which um, uh, some of you may be familiar with um, it's the financial district um, in uh, in London um, there were a number of smart bins uh, installed earlier on this year which effectively collected details of passes by by Wi-Fi sniffing um, their mobile devices uh, that you know was used in all for all, all manner of information like footfall um, the frequency with which the same people passed by um, the speed with which people are going and so on and so forth now there was a significant backlash um, because uh, there was a lack of transparency about it um, it was considered by many to be intrusive um, but importantly there's a real lack of clarity about what the customer benefit was you know what's in it for me what's the what's the value exchange so there's a lot of uncertainty there's a lot of there's a lack of um, understanding about well what are the benefits of this um, but also I think there's an increasing sense that a purely data-driven approach uh, you know can fundamentally lack accuracy it's perhaps too reductionist um, to what extent is it really able to um, predict uh, human behavior um, and of course you know no discussion on this is uh, complete without invoking Nate Silver you know, the pin-up um, uh, boy for the big data movement who himself flagged limitations saying it's questionable if a computer can really capture the subtlety and personalization of human um, uh, that real human beings demonstrate across social contexts so a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of concerns around it, um, which are then translating into some generalized uh, anxiety, um, which some brands are picking up. Um, so, uh, so in addition to that sort of concerns about effectiveness, um, then is there is a there's a real consumer concern about um, the willingness to engage with brands in this way. So, for example, we found that 81 percent of the consumers that we spoke to were saying that they would consider it much more likely to give their business to companies that they trust to use their data appropriately. So, we're starting to see some brands using that to differentiate themselves. Um, famously and somewhat controversially um, Microsoft, Microsoft with their Scroogle campaign um, but there are also services like DuckDuckGo go, um, uh, popping up which are um, uh, search engines which um, uh, uh, claim not to track your customer behavior not to track your, your um, online activity but also we're starting to see uh, customers uh, consumers wanting to have a greater say about the way in which their data is used so um, uh, we, we found a rather astonishing 38% of consumers have taken in the UK online consumers have taken some steps to block online advertising much higher than any other industry estimate that um, uh, that I've seen um, and I think the first estimate based on consumer survey data um, and 47% are saying that they want to um, have more control over the way in which their personal data is being used and there's plenty of companies springing up um, that are helping individuals to manage the way in which their personal data is used my permissions being a good example um, that you can put in details there of um, what you're willing to share across which applications and it will monitor the way in which your um, personal data is being used and shared across those applications so giving you greater control um, over that so we see a mix of issues coming up you know there, there's some concerns about the way in which it's being used there are uh, concerns about limitations of its effectiveness um, there are uh, people wanting to have more control over usage of personal data and I think there's perhaps a more fundamental issue as well um, is whether there is only so far 
that um, personalization using personal data can go. Uh, because at some point, does it simply get too personal and too creepy? Um, and that's a term which we hear a lot when we're doing research in this area, this, um, the sense of um, uh, the, the, the personalized advertising becoming, you know, following you around and essentially becoming, people becoming creeped out. And this is where the idea of the uncanny valley comes in. This is a term which was um, first proposed by a roboticist called Mori back in the 1970s who found that as, um, uh, human, as, as robotics became more and more personal, more and more human-like, um, then uh, the people working with people working with them um, became more and more creeped out by it. They really disliked it, and there's a sense of um, you suddenly there's a there's a sort of move upwards in the right direction. As people like some level uh, of more human humanness about it, but it gets to a certain point, and then it all suddenly drops off a cliff um, into the uncanny valley. Um, there's quite a lot of anecdotal evidence around this. Um, there's uh, films which are uh, considered which use CGI. Uh, which are considered to have um, portrayed um, uh, humans uh, in a very uh, realistic form using CGI um, have uh, its claim tends to do poorer at the box office than CGI characters which are a little bit more cartoon-like and the contrasts are often made between Polar Express and Brave. Um, for those of you who have got uh, sort of children of my age will be sort of uh, uh, very familiar with them. Um, what we're currently doing is just exploring the degree to which this uh, it, it give, trying to create, generate some empirical evidence to um, uh, explore the degree to which this exists and how that varies across context and categories um, and, and so on. But it does rather suggest to us that there are some concerns and some pitfalls in the way in which personal data is currently being used. Now. I think it's, let's switch to looking at the way in which personal data um, has been used in a completely different way. Um, so rather than consumers being mere providers of their personal data to brands, can we as consumers be making good use of personal data ourselves? Now the quantified self community, the, uh, that's uh, individuals who are very interested in self-measurement and learning from that self-measurement, have of course been doing this for some time. That's typically historically been focused in the area of health behaviors. Um, Larry Smarr was perhaps um, often cited as one of the people who sort of founded the movement, who famously um, identified that he was uh, developing Crohn's disease before the doctors um, diagnosed him by measurement of um, a wide variety of his own um, sort of um, uh, personal symptoms um, and tracking those. Um, and health and fitness um, have generally sort of been sort of uh, continuous drivers of this and now you can get obviously wearable technology which is really giving you uh, levels of um, measurement which frankly um, are as good often as many things which you would see um, in an A&E department. So, but we're moving from uh, just measuring health to measuring emotions to measuring things like financial spending and so on and increasingly as uh, wearable technology and other forms of data become available, this is going to be an increasingly important movement in my mind. And on that, you know, the amount of data that individuals can access, you know, historically has been somewhat limited. Um, brands held data on you and, you know, you couldn't access that data. That's changing. Really, now if you wanted to get access on um, your uh, mobile phone usage, your tariffs, your bank accounts and so on, you can get hold of that. You can get hold of them as CSV files, but it's still clunky. That's changing. Governments worldwide are kick-starting uh, a revolution, essentially a data revolution in terms of the, um, in the UK, it's called the My Data Program, um, and it's really all about easily placing data in the hands of consumers. And there's a whole variety of companies, a whole ecosystem being set up to help consumers to use this to help them make better decisions, manage their relationships with brands more effectively. So you may ask, all very well, but where does market research come into this? I think that the way in which new personal data brokers are coming into the market gives us a clue. I mean, market research was historically um, a broker between brands and consumers. Uh, consumers would participate because they could see that their participation would enhance products and services. 
but now I think it's less clear to consumers. Um, you know, are we actually you know working with them to enhance products and services, or are we finding better ways for companies to sell things to them? And I think there's a bit of a lack of clarity in the of the market research role in the value chain, and that's leading to, in my mind, declining response rates. And uh, you know, we we try and address these as much as possible through a variety of means. Um, but at the heart of it, there is still a fundamental question that consumers ask, what's in it for me? What's the value exchange that's going on for me in this particular relationship? So I think there's some work which we need to do in order to address this. Um, there are a couple of examples of companies that I think are carving out an interesting role between brands and consumers um, and using personal data about consumers to act on their behalf. So one of them is Noddle. Um, Noddle provides verification of your credit rating for life for free. That's a clear benefit there for consumers that then can um, uh, provide information to Noddle. They then get the certification, they get a token from Noddle um, that they can use online to apply for different um, financial, financial products without having to then do a, a new credit rating each time um, and then getting to the end of the um, sign up process and then finding uh, actually I'm, I don't qualify for this. They can use that in advance. Advance. Um, there's a real benefit for the consumer that is um, uh, derived from that um, and Noddle then gets a small commission each time they use that credit rating to buy a new product um, or each time the consumer uses that in order to buy a new product. Another really good example um, and just worth checking out is the Cheap Energy Club. Um, uses your personal data to look for offers on your behalf. Now at the moment you have to apply, you have to you have to input your own data, but in the future I think it's very clear that that would come more directly into um, this particular this particular application. So you then state your preference for how much you want to save. It'll then go off and regularly just review the different tariffs on the market and flag to you whenever there's an amount, whenever there's a, an opportunity for you to save a particular amount. So again, it's a it's a brand coming in which is using your personal data in a way that you specify you want them to use it. Importantly, you are specifying your intent of how you want that to be used, um, and it's then um, managing and facilitating that relationships with brands. So I think the examples that you know, I'm giving um, sort of illustrate how personal data means that new companies are stepping into that space between consumers and brands. And I think that was a, this is a space which was historically traditionally occupied by market research. So this means I think there's an opportunity for us to take a fundamentally, the industry to take a fundamentally different approach to the way in which personal data is being used. So working in a way that's not just about targeting consumers, which some may come to consider to be a you know, somewhat predatory and ultimately a somewhat limited opportunity um, uh, to, with that approach, but it's really reclaiming a role for market research that the, the, where the quantify self community has showed us the benefits and showed us the way forward and which is now this kind of multi-billion pound economy facilitating insights through for consumers through data analytics for individuals and then facilitating that bridge with um, uh, businesses. So if you want a new pair of running shoes then the personal data on your running can be used on your behalf to find the right pair of shoes, the right price and the right brand. And to sort of look at how that might work, I mean, you know, have a check out the companies like Visual DNA and Influence, um, and there are many companies in this particular space, because um, in a way that's what they do. Um, but perhaps they are sort of managing the sorts of advertising which you might want to see online, but there are early examples. There's many cropping up in that same fertile territory where in a sense the whole business model is shift. We're shifting from um, uh, the, 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 uh, the idea of um, uh, uh, CRM, consumer relationship management, to VRM. Um, and what are the implications of that? Which way does that, which, what, how does that then play out within the market research industry? So I think in summary, I think the, the market research industry needs to reassert its authority over understanding the consumer which means that we really need to engage more as an industry with personal data. It's fundamentally changing business models. And it's a question of whether we should continue with our same business model or do we need to start flipping around our business model more and start thinking about how we can um, explore some fundamentally different approaches which start fixing that value exchange between ourselves and consumers 
and ultimately between consumers and brands. I think this is a really interesting time for market research. There's some very interesting challenges. I think there's some very real threats. It's our uh, call to make those threats into a real opportunity for the, for the industry. Thank you. Happy to take any questions.